The word entrepreneurship stirs images of innovation, risk-taking, and of finding a creative approach to starting and building a business or enterprise. That entrepreneurial spirit was important to settlers who built places like the Cottonwood Ranch and is equally as vital for those who call the Great Plains home today. What I interpret from entrepreneurism in the high plains of uh, Western Kansas is you have to have a, a desire to do it, but you have to have an imagination on what may work. And the people coming out here in the, the late 19th century uh, came out here to survive, but they imagined on what it could be. And that imagination is still going uh, for people to change the way, to change the way they thought to try different things. My name is Emily Campbell. I am the owner and executive chef of the Elephant Bistro and Bar in Hoxie, Kansas. My name is Cody Epp. I'm one of the owners of Open Spaces Sports a video streaming company here in Western Kansas. I'm Scott Sproul. I'm the CEO of the Northwest Kansas Economic Innovation Center. Our organization is a private operating foundation that works to bring finance to companies that need it, to resources to entrepreneurs that need it, and also helping people find the workforce they need within our region. My dad has been in the broadcast business for well, over 50 years now. Several uh, of his friends got together and they, they kind of discussed video streaming. Maybe he could broadcast the high school sports and video stream instead of being on the radio. Originally, I was born and raised in Hoxie. My husband is also from the area, Doug Campbell. We moved up to the Seattle area because of his career. And at that point in time, I was tired of sitting behind a desk, and so I decided to go into culinary school. I worked under some pretty renowned chefs, learned a lot. Um, we moved back home so he could take over his family business. I started working for our family business, Case IH dealership here in town. I think for me, I recognized the future of where the internet was going, I guess, in a general sense, and, and how much it was going to be a part of our everyday lives. You know, on the radio, you can only broadcast one game every every night. You know, you just have one station you can do it on, but with the internet, we were, that kind of opened things up. It allowed us to do virtually an unlimited amount. I was doing a little bit of catering just for some private events, and people really enjoy just the versatility and the unique offerings that I was providing. And so then this building became available and some really good friends of ours helped us open the elephant. You know, he'd probably been in business for about a year or so uh, when I came on with him. And then in 2011, I covered Hoxie for the first time in the sub-state basketball in the state there. A local guy, Mike Mintz, who works at uh, Equity Bank here in Hoxie, he had asked me at that, at that state tournament, he said, what would it take for you guys to cover us? all year and, and everything that we do. We kind of talked about it over the summer and we put things together and we were able to, to generate enough interest and, and enough people locally that were willing to take a chance, I guess, on a new, a new opportunity. I try to support all the local farmers around here as well. Um, we source our beef, our pork, our lettuce, um, a lot of our produce during the summertime and a few other items from just people within a 60 mile radius here. Utilize what you have in your area. Um, you know, it's going to be the most fresh when it's coming directly from the source. Uh, I think first and foremost, it does something for the kids. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it's about promoting them, uh, giving them the opportunity to, to be able to hear their name called, um, to be able to hear, uh, you know, broadcasters get excited about uh, what they're doing. I know that it's also helped allow people who grew up here, graduated from these schools and graduated from these communities, but have since moved away. It's allowed them to stay connected to their roots. Yeah, not only did I want to provide something different and you know grow a business out here, I wanted to make sure our community has something to thrive upon and attract other people to live in small town America. As an example of some of our great small communities, we're sitting here in downtown Moreland, Kansas. We're sitting in front of the Community Foundation building that is serving as a shared space. We've got one of the most technological precision ag companies across the street in Pack Leader. We've got a nonprofit grocery store, a community that said, we've got to have a grocery store, came together and built a fantastic opportunity. 
which also has a certified kitchen where entrepreneurs that like to bake, like to do food products, can go in and use that facility. It's, it's a fantastic example of something you should believe in and be able to help it move forward. It's very scary to go out on a limb and start something that you're not sure if it's going to be successful. And I think that's always been a big question I've got was, did you realize how successful this was going to be? And I said, no, I just, I kind of went by the mentality and I don't know if it's a good one. We'll build it and hope that the people come and they did. Entrepreneurship matters in small rural communities because they were settled by entrepreneurs, people that built businesses to supply the goods and services for people that wanted to settle in Kansas. Entrepreneurship on the High Plains in the early settlement was very important. Abraham Pratt came out here first in 1878. He had been a sailor with the British Navy, but he was also an entrepreneur. He had a bottling works, at least two pubs, maybe three. Came out here from England, you know, an immigrant, 1878. He was able to buy land from the railroad, and on that land he decided to try to develop a town. And one of the first things he did since building a town is he uh, developed part of his land to go into lots. Uh, the town was platted, only about three blocks, but he started a lumber yard. And also had the post office. He was the town's first postmaster. So here you had two businesses in one, the post office and the lumber yard, where you could get supplies to build your homestead shack. Since there was no wood out here, that was very important. And then when he had his two sons join him, the father and the two sons were in a partnership too, and they were all entrepreneurs in their own sense. So maybe the Pratts did see the, the, what they needed to be an entrepreneur in as much as there was a lot of land to be developed. There were a lot of people that were gonna move into the land to be developed. Uh, they needed to be fed, they needed to be clothed, and there was a need of money. Abraham kinda kicked off the thing, but John Fenton Pratt went in another way and they had no agricultural background that we know of and he started a sheep ranch but it was also a money lender. Even in the early 1880s he began lending money to people coming in. Not a whole lot at first but then it became to be probably the primary business. Uh, he was a money lender, he also invested wisely and also with the entrepreneurship he tried things such as alfalfa. In 1892 alfalfa wasn't growing, this had been a sea of grass and so he tried alfalfa. It worked. Uh, the bottom lands uh, just south of the ranch was an alfalfa field to feed the livestock and to make money on. He was the middleman for broom corn. In the early 1900s, broom corn was a, a very popular crop in this area. And he had some of his own, but mostly he was the middleman and they would bring him the broom corn and they would bale it in, in big bales. And then he was, was the man to put it on the trains and ship it to, to broom factories in St. Louis. He was making money on, on the wool, uh, being the entrepreneur. The shearing shed, he let a lot of people shear sheep in that. In fact, although he, at the top, he probably only had 3,500 sheep, there were times when they'd shear uh, seven, 8,000 8,000 sheep in a shearing shed a year. So he was probably making a little bit of money on that, on paying the shears or a percentage of the wool. The Cottonwood Ranch is only a quarter mile from the railroad depot and the stockyard, so they could uh, bag the wool here, very short trip, loaded on the cars and take it out once the railroad was through and being used in 1890. So John Fenton Pratt tried a lot of things. They did not know what grew out here because these guys were not agricultural. Uh, the high plains of Kansas was very new country in the 1880s. Uh, nobody was really living here or lived here long enough to prove any crops. They kind of knew that wheat would grow, but corn was the king for a while. But he was also the entrepreneur in as much as the trees. Uh, with the Homestead Act, there was a Part of that act was called the Timber Culture Act. So it was have people plant trees on government land, and after they cultivate these trees for eight years and they grow to maturity, then they will get a patent or the, uh, the deed for the land from the government. Well, John Fenton Pratt, as an entrepreneur, decided he'd be the middleman on trees. So some of his records show where he's ordered thousands of trees at a time, mostly from nurseries out of Salina, Kansas, and Emporia, Kansas. Also with the timber claim thing, as an entrepreneur, to have a timber claim, you didn't have to be a citizen of the state of Kansas. All you had to do is contact the land office and say that you wanted to get a permit for a timber claim. There was one timber claim that was about a half mile west of the Cottonwood Ranch. The permit was given to a guy by the name of Dial or Deal, D-I-E-H-L, out of Iowa. Well, John Fenton Pratt sold him the trees to put on it. 
John Fenton Pratt also took care of the timber claim because the, t the timber had to be cultivated and watered and stuff. He would hire a man to take care of the timber claim, to hoe the trees, maybe water them and stuff, and, and give him a dollar. Well, but the final bill that time, deal or dial, in Iowa received the bill, it was $10. So if you can make $9 on a $1 investment, that was pretty good entrepreneurship. There were other English in the area. In fact, the Turtle family, Howard and Frederick Turtle, they were druggists. They started a general store called the Turtle Store. They started a hotel. They had a creamery. They could make medicines. Uh, they could sell food. They had some of the coal business and all sorts of stuff. So you could buy anything at that general store. And that was very important to have a mercantile store. You could go in and get anything from anywhere and also mail order out of it. And of course, with the mail order, you made a little bit of profit too. So the turtles also homesteaded in the area. The turtles had some sheep. There's another family of Pratt's that came through that had been from uh, uh, Kirkstone, England, which is near Leeds. Well, they started the cattle ranch about three miles west of Cottonwood Ranch and about two south on the cattle. And they expanded not only here, but they expanded on to, to Hoxie and had meat markets in Hoxie for season. And it was both wild game uh, by season but also domestic stuff, uh, beef, pork, and, and chickens, or geese, turkeys, whatever. A lot of these homesteaders that came out did not have the livestock yet to do it. They were out here to, to settle, to make improvements on their land, and hopefully survive. And you had to feed the people to get them going the first few years to help them out. With the other family of Pratt's that I talked about being the meat merchants, they had daughters in the family. And two of the daughters, Anne and Gertrude, were able to get the contract to carry mail. And they would have to ride to Buffalo Park, uh, 25 miles southwest of the Cottonwood Ranch, uh, now known as Park, Kansas, down by Interstate 70 in Gove County. They would ride to pick up the mail at three, three times a week. So 25 miles, three times a week, and that's back and forth. So that's 150 miles a week that they were riding horseback, and they were riding side saddle. They were very proper British ladies. They wore the long skirts, as we can see in the picture. And this side saddle, that Pratt family still has that. Uh, Gertrude never married, but she was very successful. She was very talented musically and artistically. She started a dress shop and millinery store in Hoxie, Kansas, once she moved off the ranch. And literally, people would come from 100 miles around to have her design a, a hat for them or get the, the fine dresses that she either tailored or in some cases she would buy the dress because the early newspaper articles will talk about uh, Miss Gertrude Pratt had been to Kansas City or Denver to, to look at some, some clothing for the new spring line or winter line or whatever it may be. A lot of the women became entrepreneurs in as much as if the women were milking. A lot of women, even uh, Jenny Pratt that lived here, there was a surplus of milk, so she would separate that and get the cream, make the butter, and then trade the butter to the turtle store for other groceries. Uh, the women with their egg money, you know, they always talked about saving their egg money because that was profit. You had chickens to eat, but you also had the surplus of eggs. You sold the eggs when you went to town, or as the people said, traded them. There was sometimes no money exchanged, but you did ex exchange the goods. And that's entrepreneurship too, yeah. It's hard to save eggs and put them in a bank for years to come, but you could save the money. So these women, uh, when you think it was an all-male world, but if it wasn't for the, the women, it wouldn't have worked. Through the decades, much of entrepreneurship in the Great Plains was naturally tied to agriculture. The entrepreneurship of agriculture in the high plains of Kansas is always a risk, whether you're gonna hit it right or not. So you learn to be very frugal and learn to save and try to figure out the most efficient means to grow a crop as inexpensively as possible. Well, as more people came in, there was more demand for goods. In the first decade of the 20th century, the wheat became a very big deal. And with World War I going on, it caused a worldwide economic boom. And so a lot of the land was broken out for wheat fields. The farmers made a lot of money on it. The breaking out of the soil changed the environment. It changed the focus of agriculture. It went from sheep and cattle to more of farming, and also the adaptation of, of big machinery, the big steam tractors and others. The 1920s were pretty good. We talk about the roaring 20s, but the, the rains came, the crops were good, people were still adjusting to various sorts of crops. And then, of course, 
In late 1929, the Depression hit, and then it turned into the Dust Bowl years of the 1930s. The wind blew. There were no crops being raised. There was no money around. There was no way to get money. Very bad. A lot of people moved out of the country. But with that, the entrepreneurship with World War II came along. Sheep were still pretty big at that time because our soldiers were needing wool in World War II in the 1940s. And also there was an excess of, of mutton or meat from sheep. The crops changed. They were still growing corn, wheat. They tried Milo. In the 1950s, the wheat crop was good again. Uh, people decided to farm even more and they put in irrigation. And with irrigation, more corn was grown and, and also sugar beets were tried. Sugar beets were very, very profitable for a few years. Most of the sugar beets had been grown in the eastern Colorado, in the Great Plains, in the Rocky Mountain Trough. They really started in southwestern Kansas around uh, Garden City and found out that the sugar beets were very successful if they could be irrigated. And they did do quite well, but they were labor intensive to grow sunflowers that were always considered a weed in western Kansas. People still plant sunflowers, and that kind of booms and busts. But there were other things that people tried. Some people tried raising llamas for their wool. Another uh, entrepreneur idea was raising ostriches for the meat, for the feathers, for the skins, and for the eggs. And the eggs were, were good. They could resell to uh, people that wanted to hatch them, put in incubators quite well. The eggs, after they were blown, or the term used for hauling it out, were good uh, basis for artwork. Skin from the legs were used to make boots. The feathers were used for ornamentation. And the meat. Uh, the meat was actually sold in some of the local restaurants. The phase came and it went. <laughs> the other thing that came across with a lot of corn in western Kansas was the ethanol projects where you could make fuel from the alcohol derived from the corn. But it also works quite well, well because the leftovers of that are called uh, distiller's grain, and those can be fed to the, the cattle too, that are very nutritious and is kind of a waste from one process to feed another process and make a good profit on that. There's booms and busts all the time in agriculture of one thing will be high priced, and as an example, wheat is at a high price, so what you'll do is say next year I'm going to grow a lot of wheat. Supply and demand always hits. You grow more wheat, the price goes down because everybody did the same. Uh, but it's a risk. We're seeing a lot of growth in entrepreneurship in our region. Uh, when you look at the past history, entrepreneurship was mainly focused on ag. Now with technology and the fiber infrastructure we have in Northwest Kansas, we've got companies that are coming here and companies that are looking at Kansas to provide the workforce that they need through entrepreneurship. Some of the, the younger generation that has grown up 100% with the internet being a part of their life, when they come back out here, they, they keep that. And I think with, with the internet, it allows for so many different kinds of entrepreneurial uh, I, things to happen. One example would be in Goodland, Kansas. There is two entrepreneurs that come together to start training people on cyber technology and now has built it into a multi-million dollar company in Northwest Kansas. Attracting those employees, giving them the great opportunity to come in to our region is because we had the investment and the resources over the years for the fiber technology. And the reason that people look for um, opportunities in Northwest Kansas, not only because of our infrastructure we have here, it's because that People really care about doing a good job here. They are hardworking, they love to help companies move forward, and it's an opportunity for not only people to come here and for companies to invest in us, but also an opportunity for people to come home. I have to give my family, my grandfather and my father and uncles and aunts and props because they're, you know, my grandpa was the one who made the Case IH dealership what it is here in town um, and as well as two other surrounding communities. Once we realized we could do more than just one game a night, you know, let's say one, more than one football game on a Friday night, once we realized that that was a possibility and then Mike Mintz asking, you know, what would it take? It, it was kind of just like, well, a commitment, I guess, is really what it's going to take from, from the general public, the people, the school, uh, and also from us, 
The reason we're so invested in Northwest Kansas as a whole is because the people that are here, the people of, that are here uh, want to see their communities grow again, and I think we will. We'll see those communities grow because of the investment locally, not only from our foundation, but communities. My dad has always been a big, you know, advocate for supporting local and making sure that we keep our small towns thriving and growing. And so I really felt like it was just something good to do for the community. There's a thousand ways to make a business run with the internet on how you get paid. We've chosen to go out and see the businesses, the people in the communities, the people that um, are invested in those communities, in those schools, and we've asked them to, to sponsor. The majority of them don't do it because they necessarily need to advertise anything. Um, they do it literally just to support what's going on. And for me, that's the essence of rural America is one guy helping another guy. That kind of comes full circle back for me anyways, in my mind back to Back to 100 years ago, um, you know, when you think about the 30s, there was a lot of bankers out here that that kind of just didn't worry about the bank note when people were struggling. You know, they, they let them go ahead and farm their land. They let them go ahead and do what they needed to do. And and it was, they were being entrepreneurial on that, going, you know what, when the time's right, you'll make it right. And, and trusting in that and just believing in people. And um, I think rural America has a way bigger entrepreneurial mindset than most people would give it credit for. We've got community foundations that are making investments uh, in all of our communities. We're uh, raising money for endowment to sustain things that otherwise might be non-sustainable. And just the opportunity for uh, companies to see what we have here and uh, grow with us. I would say our radius of attraction is definitely 90 miles, but we reach further. We have people traveling across the United States who will look us up on Google, wing off of interstate and drive that 50 miles just to come experience our food. So Hoxie and then Oakley, uh, we do the same thing. Wallace County, Northern Valley, we've jumped on board covering all their basketball games, um, all the road games last year for Hill City, and then a countless amounts of just area games for for the leagues out here, for those smaller schools that just don't get a lot of coverage in general, we try to cover them as much as we can. And, uh, on average, now we're covering 950 to 1,000 broadcasts a year. We've had people from Germany, from California, from Hawaii, from you name it. I mean, it's just been insane how many people have come here. Whether they have ties to something here in Northwest Kansas or not, they, they have stopped. Oh, I think entrepreneurism in Western Kansas, I think as time goes on, there are things out there that we have never dreamed would happen that will by the next generations. Uh, if they keep adjusting to the land and keep adapting to the society, yeah, there's a lot of potential. I think it's great, you know, to, like I said, to see this region grow and to see what opportunities are out here. And I would say, come out and enjoy it. Enjoy what's offered in the, the feel of the community. I think that's the biggest thing is like, everybody's so friendly and so willing to help everybody else out here. It makes it inviting to want to live here. It makes it comfortable and cozy and just, hey, yeah, I can swing down to the elephant and have some great cocktails, and then I can go out with friends and go golfing at the golf course to go fishing at the lake. Or, you know, if we want to jump over and do a small boutique shopping in Hayes, Kansas, or some of the other surrounding small towns that have really cool boutique stores, it's all right here. I guess my hope for the future of Northwest Kansas is that people look at it as an economic opportunity for them and their family. A place where they can come back and uh, let their kids grow up in a small community that has a school that their kids could play all the sports they want and be involved in everything. It's, it's truly amazing to see how people can find with our technology and what we have now a way back home.